reported from Gaza, I fought in Gaza. Um, when we speak about uh, the principles of uh, war, these are the IDF principles of war, uh, not media-oriented, but the real principles of war, how we conduct, how we train our officers, and how we, um, the principles that we, by which we fight. And they're very much true to media operations as well. Uh, you definitely want to maintain the initiative. You want to have a clear aim of your goal. You want to make sure that your efforts are effective. And you want to safeguard yourself. And uh, a few other things that are true in combat, as they are in media. And I'll try to make a few examples of how they are done in uh, our current operations. Now, a little bit about the current situ uh, security situation. This is 2011. Uh, the Middle East, and I'm sure that there are many people in the room with far more knowledge about the Middle East than I have, uh, but the, uh, the map or the fault lines of the Middle East, uh, the, the borders, the countries, in 2011, we had uh, sovereign countries all around us. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Syria had full control of its uh, borders then. Hezbollah was already then a very strong political force in Lebanon and the biggest uh, military threat to, uh, to Israel at that time as well. But Syria had a uh, military that was capable of maneuvering into Israel and posed a significant uh, threat to Israeli, uh, Israeli well, a military threat to Israel. Um, Iraq was intact, uh, more or less, and uh, we had full Egyptian control over Sinai, no real terrorist entities here. And uh, as you all know, and we very much cherish, uh, peace agreements with Jordan and Egypt. Uh, Gaza was under its fourth year of Hamas rule. Uh, not, probably not a nice place to live. Probably not a nice place to live, but not nowhere near as horrible as it is, uh, as it is today. If we fast forward, and I'm, I am of course paraphrasing a lot, the situation has changed in terms of the amount of international focus and attention uh, to what is happening in the region and the amount of dynamics with regards to things happening around us, by us, and at us, aimed at Israel. And I'll uh, name a few things. First and foremost, Iranian deployment in Syria. Uh, there should be no confusion, and the previous speaker spoke about it a bit, uh, and I think uh, it cannot be overstated um, the amount, the, the, the threat that we perceive from uh, Iran and their aggressive posture, their uh, attempts to establish offensive military capabilities inside Syria, and their attempts to transfer uh, high-tech weaponry from uh, Iran via I Iraq through Syria and then eventually into uh, Lebanon. The Prime Minister spoke about it at the UN General Assembly uh, a week or so ago. We followed up with additional intellig intelligence about where Hezbollah is hiding conversion facilities in southern Beirut, very close to the Rafik Hariri International Airport, by the way, uh, a few hundred meters away from the runway. And uh, today the situation is of not really a threat from a maneuvering military belonging to the Syrian armed forces. They are busy doing other things and, and trying to reorganize, but a, still a significant threat from Hezbollah. More than 120,000 rockets uh, aimed, all of them at Israeli civilians, many of them hidden behind uh, Lebanese civilians, and basically a Hezbollah strong, uh, 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 basically having full uh, control over, or not full control, but a lot of control over the, over the Lebanese state. On the Golan, today, we uh, marked the reopening of the Cuneta border crossing uh, between Israel and Syria, which allows, facilitates the transport of UNDOF, the UN forces there on the Golan, between Israel and Syria. That's a significant milestone. Uh, it has been closed since uh, August 14 and opened just today, and that indicates a return to the previous situation which we had before, and perhaps a return to a more stable situation with regards to Syria. In the near future, maybe Syria will be able to regain control of its borders, but Iran uh, and other uh, very hostile actors remain within Syria, and they are a si significant concern for us. In the south, 
there has been a lot of fighting between uh, Egyptian security forces and Daesh, uh, the last real active ISIS entity in the Middle East. There's still a few entities in, uh, in Africa, uh, but ISIS is more or less defeated here. They had, or still have, a presence here who haven't really attacked Israel, but not for lack of trying. They're just busy fighting for their own survival and uh, are uh, really fighting a hard battle against the Egyptian security forces who are making gains and re-establishing the situation, but a significant threat exists here as well. You, the last panel spoke about uh, Gaza. And uh, I'll only add to what was said before about the current situation, the complexity, uh, the, the threat that, that is perceived from there by saying that I'll say a few words about Hamas's decision making. An important milestone was October the 30th, 2017. That is when we, the IDF, were able to detect and destroy uh, a Hamas tunnel, a terror tunnel that was dug from inside Gaza for two and a half kilometers under our fence into Israel. Uh, it was the first tunnel that we destroyed since 2014, but since we have destroyed 14 more. So the total is 15. That has been made possible by new technological developments. We now have a system in place where we can detect and destroy, destroy tunnels either from the air or with the ground troops. Now why is that important? Because that was, together with the rockets and, and mortars that Hamas have, really the biggest uh, terror <coughs> leverage that Hamas used to have on the Israeli population uh, living close to the border. Once we were able to take that away from Hamas or to destabilize their capability to rely on those terror tunnels, that forced Hamas to rethink their strategy and to focus uh, their activity differently. And what happened a few months after that? Pesach, Passover 2018, Hamas started uh, with what in many places in the international media unfortunately is still referred to as protests, but what we see are very violent riots and attempts to attack and infiltrate into Israel by using Gazan civilians, launching themselves at the fence, trying to dismantle security infrastructure in order to breach our defenses and get inside Israel. We have been going now for more than seven months. Uh, every Friday, from the 30th of March, 2018, until today, every Friday and a few other uh, uh, days in between. I'm sure you'll remember May, uh, the 14th of May uh, this year with the opening of the American Embassy in Jerusalem was a key, uh, was a milestone. And uh, that is really, when you think about and when you read about what, what's happening in Gaza, this is Hamas acting differently choosing a different strategy and tactics, uh, uh, understanding that their military capabilities are very limited and choosing to do things differently in order to still focus attention uh, and to draw uh, media attention and, and, and uh, political attention to what's happening in, in, uh, inside Gaza with no other uh, success to their name. They've been ruling uh, Gaza for more than 11 years and have very little to show for. Um, I could speak, of course, a lot about what's happening in Yemen, uh, also an Iranian, uh, a result of Iranian uh, intervention and, or, and uh, their export of, uh, of instability and violence. I could speak about Iraq, what's happened, what happened in Iraq and what the Iranians are doing there, uh, and I could speak more about Hezbollah. But I, I would just summarize this slide by saying that the security situation that we face is a complex one. The IDF really quite uniquely as a military, the IDF as a military quite uniquely needs to deal with the lowest level of violence today was another stabbing attempt in a junction not far from Jerusalem a Palestinian tried to stab an Israeli woman as two soldiers who were there uh, were able to uh, neutralize and, and, and shoot him before he was able to stab anyone. This happened just a few hours ago. So on the lower end of the spectrum, we deal with the lone attackers, the stabbers. On the higher end of the spectrum, we need to be able to deal with uh, uh, ballistic missiles and the possibility of a nuclear Iran and everything in between. So counterterrorism, uh, maneuvering forces, stationary forces, guerrilla, uh, terror inside cities, uh, in open terrain, in 
in the mountains and in the desert, and tunnel warfare. Uh, that is the uh, introduction to my, uh, when I speak about the media environment and where we fight, it's important to have that in mind uh, once we think about uh, what we do. In terms of the idea of spokesperson unit, we're a unit of approximately 500 men and women deployed into different branches. I apologize that it's too far and too many small uh, uh, icons, uh, lack of, uh, uh, I didn't uh, think that through good enough, but I'll just say that we're part of the general staff. We receive our orders directly from the chief of staff and we have essentially three missions uh, and I will explain it with this slide. Our mission, the first and most, most important mission, I'm sure many of you know that the IDF is a conscript military. We still have mandatory military service in Israel. We rely on uh, almost all or a very large part of all of the 18 year olds in Israel to serve. And therefore, it is vital that we have the public trust, the Israeli domestic public trust. Uh, surveys are done on this, of course. There are independent polls of different Israeli institutions, and we uh, continuously, over many, many decades, are rated with an approval rating, uh, equivalent of an approval rating, of above 90%, by far the highest level of trust of any Israeli institution that uh, or how it is tr uh, trusted by the Israeli public. That is the first and most important part of our job. The second part is to strengthen the legitimacy of uh, IDF's activity and also to deter the enemy. We do so with, of course, engaging with different audiences. Uh, the first and the primal one, the most important one, the Israeli audience, and then we speak to the world with the world, different audiences across the world. That is uh, my branch. Uh, uh, we do that, and then we have an Arabic-speaking spokesperson whom I will uh, show in, uh, in just a second. Now, with that comes a challenge, because when we, uh, uh, it, based on our mission, we of course have to tailor our messages to three different audiences uh, with different goals and perspectives. Now, you'll be able to appreciate that when, when an event happens, the concerns for the Israeli public, for the mothers and fathers in Israel. They want to know that their sons and daughters are safe, that they're being taken care of as soldiers, and that they can trust in the IDF, in the commanders and the decision making, that they are well equipped and well prepared for whatever mission we have. Many times we would want to project to the Israeli public a lot of strength so that the Israeli public continues to trust and believe in what the IDF does and that we are ready for any challenge that we're going to meet. On the other hand, towards the international audience, we don't necessarily want to project the strongest image that we can. We will definitely want to emphasize other aspects of our activity, not only uh, how powerful, how fast, how the, the capabilities we have, the intelligence, etc., etc. But then, on a third side, vis-à-vis -vis the Arabic-speaking uh, uh, audiences, and not all of them are enemies, but I am uh, paraphrasing here, uh, we would want to deter. We would want to send a strong message of deterrence, highlighting our capabilities, highlighting the price of aggressing against Israel. Uh, and you can see that there is a tension between these three different audiences, a tension that is coming, uh, becoming even more challenging because the panel here of journalists before will tell you that uh, Anshel Pfeffer writes for Haaretz, uh, but he writes in English. Uh, out of the 250 uh, foreign correspondents who are permanently uh, uh, positioned here in Israel, most of them will go to Haaretz and refresh the homepage of Haaretz for their daily Israeli news, right? Haaretz, as uh, the gentleman in the back from, uh, from the UK uh, pointed out, which was someone before, has a certain uh, uh, editorial agenda, as other new newspapers have different agendas, which is fine and, and, and totally uh, acceptable. However, when the international media, uh, the, the, the lines between domestic media and international media are becoming ever more difficult to detect, uh, while we still have to be, sorry, be, uh, be able to communicate different messages to different audiences, in real time uh, and to try to get them across for different purposes. So that's one of the challenges we deal with. 
uh, on the on the day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a little bit, I'll, I'll go to this one instead. A little bit about who we are and what we do. These, the lower part here, are the different social media platforms that the IDF operates or maintains in uh, different languages. I'll start with uh, what I haven't spoken about before, the Arabic language. For those of you who speak Arabic, uh, I'm, you, you probably are familiar with uh, uh, Major, soon to be Lieutenant Colonel Ali Khay Adlai, who is brilliant. He is a uh, master of the Arabic language and understands Arabic tradition, scriptures, uh, norms, and culture, and is able to communicate via his social uh, uh, pages and directly to the Arabic speaking media, all of the large networks as well as Lebanese, uh, Syrian, Palestinian uh, media outlets, and really is a rare, I would call him a national asset. Uh, I'll give a few examples of the type of, of activity that Avichai is, uh, is part of. Uh, last week, uh, when the Prime Minister uh, revealed the Hezbollah facilities in uh, southern Beirut, the conversion uh, factories where they're converting uh, rockets into guided missiles, uh, we of course launched a campaign in order to focus Lebanese media attention to the threat that Hezbollah poses to public safety in southern Lebanon. And the point man for doing this was Avichai, where he used his social media platforms, uh, of course with intelligence and, and uh, graphics that we, have, uh, uh, that we um, provided in, uh, in advance. And he made sure to keep that topic on the public agenda in Lebanon, uh, and forced, really, Hassan Asala to deal with it uh, and to say that uh, we are not hiding uh, dangerous weapons in, uh, inside the uh, populated communities in southern Lebanon. Uh, and there are many, many other examples, but uh, that is Avichai Adrei. You can see the, the size of the platforms uh, that uh, we have. The IDF spokesperson is Brigadier General Ronen Manelis. He is our boss uh, and uh, is Focally, he really focuses on the domestic audience. Uh, and as we said before, that is the prime audience. Since we're an international forum here, then I'll speak about what we do vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the international audience. You can see highlighted are the amount of followers in each platform uh, in the English language, but we also hold French and Spanish platforms in Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and we also have uh, three websites in those same languages. So there's a very strong, dedicated effort to get our message out. We are very much aware of what you spoke about the last panel, the challenge, challenges in getting our message out uh, and overcoming a lot of bias in the traditional media. One of the ways of doing that is by producing original content by yourself and making sure that that content gets out uh, via social media platforms and uh, our platforms are growing. Uh, they are on par with the uh, Prime Minister's platform. However, we do not sponsor content. All of our followers are organic growth. Uh, we have not paid a cent in order to uh, get followers, but all of those followers we have are organic. The average reach on uh, the accumulative reach uh, by week is approximately three and a half uh, individual viewers of the different content that we produce uh, each week, which for Israeli standards is uh, very big, probably the biggest. What, what's that number again? Three and a half million. Oh, I didn't hear the million. Oh, did I say three and a half? <laughs> Thanks for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> Important one. Uh, it would be quite uh, shameful. Uh, okay, uh, we're, we're uh, expanding our YouTube uh, footprint, we have a Telegram channel, we will soon open an English one as well, and as I said, we have the uh, websites, which are less news sites, but more repository of information, longer articles, uh, which uh, you can follow if you're, or look up if you're interested. Now a little bit about the challenges. You spoke, uh, this will be a bit redundant, and I'll go shortly through it, and I'll make time for questions, because you spoke about it in the previous uh, panel about Gaza. These pictures, all of them are taken from, uh, uh, from uh, recent events. Uh, the first, really, the first clash on uh, March the 30th, 2018, when Hamas started to understand 
that uh, they're, they're changing their strategy and want started to use the population in order to infiltrate into Israel. I'm sure everyone here is, is uh, familiar with this uh, uh, lady, young lady, Miss uh, Tamimi, and her uh, public efforts. Uh, and uh, another challenge, which is uh, still go, uh, ongoing, and she's here as a symbol. This was a, uh, a medical volunteer uh, in Gaza, a 21-year-old uh, young woman who unfortunately was shot uh, as part of the uh, riots in uh, the southern Gaza Strip on the 1st of June 2018 and she became quite a symbol. Uh, the, the lady from camera spoke about the New York Times. Uh, m the New York Times and many others really uh, catapulted her to the front uh, and really made a symbol uh, of uh, and really she personifies a lot of the challenges that we deal with, which on a human perspective, right, as human beings, and as uh, Michael said from, uh, Michael Dixon from uh, Stand With Us said, every human being, every father, mother, sees suffering in Gaza, sees people who have their legs amputated, sees people who don't have fresh water, and feels compassion. Israeli soldiers defending the border feel compassion. Uh, we feel compassion and we have no interest in the situation uh, being as it is, but our primary goal is to defend our border and our civilians, which are just a few hundred meters away. So whenever there's a dilemma, inconvenient as it may be, we make sure that, <coughs> based on the first slide that I showed, we have a clear sight of the aim, what we are here to do, and for the Israeli soldiers on the ground, it's very clear. If we don't hold the line and defend, then these masses, these mobs of uh, hateful uh, people will come in and will seek to uh, uh, to kill uh, Israeli civilians. It is that clear, and it makes it very uh, clear for uh, for the Israeli soldiers what what they have to do. On the mean, in the media perspective, this is challenging to deal with the uh, international media when there are symbols like this uh, is uh, is a challenge. What we try to do is to use many different opportunities to try to focus positive attention on the many, many positive things that the IDF does and is part of. We try to uh, highlight Operation Good Neighbor, our humanitarian assistance efforts to Syrian civilians that we did for more than three and a half years, during which we provided um, emergency medical care to more than 5,000 Syrian civilians. Brought them in from Syria, treated them in Israeli hospitals, wait uh, until they were uh, fully recovered and return them back to Syria with medication, with, in cases it was needed, prosthetic devices, etc., etc., in addition to a massive humanitarian effort uh, of uh, transport of thousands of tons of fuel, food, clothing, and many other things. Uh, that operation has now ended, but I can say that this was really a, a unique humanitarian effort that the uh, IDF did. We had a few partners as well, uh, organizations from uh, around the world, and if you have questions about it, I'll elaborate uh, soon. This is, this is a picture from an IDF delegation to Mexico uh, a year and two months ago uh, to the earthquake. Uh, so we obviously want to highlight those, thi those things. International cooperation, a picture from an exercise with the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, European Command Forces who come here once in uh, two years and we conduct joint readiness exercises. Uh, American commitment to Israeli safety, is really, uh, Israeli security is really embedded, uh, really shown here. And different uh, events on the ground that we can afterwards uh, deal with. This picture here, this is the remains of an Iranian UAV that the Revolutionary Guard uh, tried to infiltrate into Israel on the 10th of February 2018. Now, if we compare this to this slide, obviously I would want to focus all day long on dealing with fighting a military. Uh, fighting a military or a, an aggressor, uh, Iranians that are approximately 1,000 kilometers, a little bit more than uh, 600 miles away from home, uh, crossing our uh, borders and attacking uh, Israel, being the beleaguerant side. Uh, so that case was a great example of us being there first, getting the information out, and really being able to influence media coverage. 
but in many other cases that is, uh, is very challenging and if you have questions about it I'll, I'll elaborate. Now, uh, you spoke before about media bias, that is, for me it's not a question uh, whether there is a media bias, I see it, I feel it, I read it, I hear it uh, every day. We will issue a statement and provide information um, and in many of the different outlets, uh, TV stations, uh, newspapers, etc., we will either receive very limited coverage of, of, of our viewpoint, or it will be questioned, or it will put within, be located within brackets, or many other things or techniques by which it, uh, uh, I, I, I can see that there is a clear uh, bias in many times. Uh, this is an example of the <coughs> so-called split screen between the opening of, these, uh, of the American Embassy and the other part of the screen, the riots in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Gaza, and a uh, few other examples of... Uh, uh, I chose this one. This is a, a, that example there. That's a picture which was the uh, front page of the New York Times and also uh, the front uh, strip on, uh, on AP of a picture of an eight-month-old eight baby from Gaza that unfortunately died uh, after one of the uh, riots. Uh, and the Palestinians, Hamas, was very quick to try to say that uh, she had died as a result of Israeli tear gas. Only afterwards, and after we questioned that narrative, uh, it became apparent, uh, and the Palestinians eventually admitted, that she had a pre-existing uh, heart condition and died of other uh, causes. Did we see a retraction? Did we see a correction? No. Uh, but it was the headlines, uh, and of course a moving uh, human story, but it wasn't true at the time. Uh, I'll give a few examples of, uh, of the positive things that uh, we're uh, capable of doing. Uh, again, an example of uh, how on CNN, which many times gives uh, uh, fair coverage, in some cases we have uh, issues about it, but more than, more than usual fair coverage. We're able to uh, uh, follow here the uh, saving of the, uh, the white helmets through Israel, uh, and a few other examples of, uh, of events where uh, the bottom line here, what I want to say is that positive media coverage is possible. Uh, it doesn't come easy and it doesn't come cheap. When we have an extremely good story, which doesn't interfere with any pre-existing uh, editorial line or ideas, then sometimes it also gets out, and sometimes it gets out the way we want it. Uh, and these are a few examples uh, of, uh, of that case. I think uh, we've, uh, we've spoken a lot about the, the riots in Gaza. These are part of the weapons that are being used, and I, I wanted to show the different types of, of weapons, not AK-47s and not machine guns, but definitely weapons that are used by uh, the Palestinians, organized, administered, paid for, and equipped by Hamas. And this is hugely underreported. You will read about uh, such and so, so and so many Palestinians killed, in, uh, in protests against, uh, uh, on the border against Israel, but you won't, you won't read, or maybe in the fifth or sixth paragraph in small, uh, small uh, font, what they brought and what they did and what that protest looked like uh, on the ground. And these are just examples. Uh, every Friday night when we uh, go over the area and clear whatever is left of, uh, of that night's uh, riots, we find uh, dozens of, uh, of IDs, uh, of, uh, of grenade, standard uh, grenades, uh, of course, Molotov, remains of Molotov cocktails, etc. Et uh, we do cooperate, e Eric left, but uh, you can't uh, mistake him. Uh, so we do, uh, we do try to seek out media outlets uh, th that we can cooperate with, uh, no matter size, or, uh, or location, and uh, we're always eager to, uh, to do uh, positive things, whether it is uh, great uh, coverage of uh, the Golan Heights that, uh, uh, that um, was done, I think you, you did a great piece, 
uh, on the humanitarian effort uh, in, uh, on the Golan Heights, how Syrians receive uh, um, inpatient uh, treatment, uh, a cooperation between the IDF and an and uh, American Christian uh, relief organization. Uh, there are a few examples of that happening. Uh, not enough, in my, uh, my opinion, and more needs to be done. But again, the end of what I would want to, uh, to the message that I would want to give. Sometimes, we need to stop for a moment. Look at our hands. started. lead us to our victories. Some of them are small, some of them are large, but they're all significant because we all know it's all in our hands. So that is the... <clears throat> that is the message that uh, I came here to, uh, to say. The bottom line, yes, challenging times, a very complex security situation, many enemies around us, uh, with capabilities and hostile intentions, uh, but uh, and and a challenging time many times in international media. However, we very much believe that it is in our hands to defend ourselves uh, and also to make to get the truth out and to have our voice heard in the international media. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to. <laughs> One question about uh, you are giving the aid and help to the so-called enemies. What is the reaction of them when you give them the help? You're from Norway? No, I'm from Finland. From Finland? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I was actually on the Golan Heights in 2011 to 2013. I was there as a liaison officer. Uh, of the IDF to UN peacekeeping forces, UNDOF. There weren't any Finnish officers there at the time, but uh, the Finns do send officers to peacekeeping. And when the first Syrians started coming across, uh, crossing the border from uh, uh, really a, a war zone uh, inside Syria, came to the fence because it was their last resort and asked for water, food, or came with a bleeding or wounded child, you could really see the fear in their eyes. You could see generations of, uh, of, of hatred and indoctrination. Um, you could see, couldn't, you know, you can't read thoughts, but you could really feel that they thought that maybe we have uh, horns on our heads and that we're going to drink uh, blood of the kids and use it for Pesach, uh, for, 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 for Seder. 
that that level of of, uh, of hatred and uh, and blind indoctrination. As time went by, and it happened quite quickly, uh, you saw more and more civilians who came forward without fear, uh, and um, a few, not many, but a few, were also brave enough to go on record in Arabic and also in English and say, uh, I am from such and such area, not their name and the village, that would be dangerous, but I am from such and such area, I came to the Israelis, they saved my life, they saved my family, and I thank them. Now, that happened a few times, not too many times, when the IDF was part of facilitating the rescue of the white helmets uh, from, uh, from Syria. Uh, we, based on an Amer American, Canadian, German, and a few other countries who were involved in it, uh, request, together with Jordan, allowed the besieged uh, white helmets uh, to escape through the Golan Heights, through the Kuneta area, into Israel via buses to Jordan and from Jordan to uh, different countries in the West. Uh, when that was over, um, I, I checked out the official uh, White Helmets uh, Twitter handle uh, and was waiting, you know, to retweet them saying thank you for saving our lives. It didn't come. Um, but that, 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 you know, we, we, can, we, we still know when we do good things and many times we do very good things. Uh, we know what is right and we know that uh, uh, we have done what is right, <laughs> saved many lives. Uh, it would be great to have those things accredited as well, not only uh, other things, but uh, it is a, uh, a step that I think will happen in the future as well. Thank you. Uh, sorry, in the front. And then... <coughs> Hello, Jonathan. Uh, Chris Mitchell with CBN News. Do you see that the uh, enemies of Israel, like Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, try to manipulate the international media as part of their strategy? Uh, against Israel and perhaps manufacture events or utilize events like that? I think um, in the book that you wrote about ISIS Iran and uh, Israel, you allude to the nature of terrorist organizations and their uh, savvy and uh, manipulation of the media as part of their modus operandi. Uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, I would give more credits to Hezbollah, but also Hamas, uh, that is what they do. They conduct uh, acts of violence and uh, almost always make sure that these acts of violence will be amplified by the media in order to achieve a political goal. What has changed, uh, what I spoke about in the briefing, is that Hamas today uh, uses their civilians, the Gazan civilians, as they sacrifice them in order to get uh, uh, international attention in an attempt to change the political situation. So they've gone from doing suicide bombings in Israeli cities, uh, once we built the, uh, the, uh, the barrier in, the, uh, in Judea and Samaria, they, weren't, they were no longer able to uh, get into Israel and blow themselves up in Israel and, and to kill Israeli civilians. They started firing rockets. We developed the Iron Dome. Now they have a difficulty in doing that and getting an effect. They started with the tunnels. Now we've cut off, cut off those tunnels. So they've uh, degenerated themselves uh, to, or their, their current resort is to try to use the, this type of, of really media operations and, and, and very cynical manipulation of their own civilians and um, I'd say a certain willingness in international media to play along. Yeah. So yes. Yes, sir. democracybroadcasting.com. Uh, we're familiar in North America with the tours of breaking the silence. Uh, uh, IDF veterans who claim, uh, in contradiction to uh, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, who claims that the IDF is the most humane army in uh, modern warfare, uh, they claim uh, ethics violations. What's the, what's the truthfulness of this group? What's their motivation and what's your position on them? We're a democratic country, we're a free society, and that is exactly how Israel, that is exactly how Israel, uh, in our opinion, of course, should remain. And that is, those are things that we cherish. Uh, part of a free society is uh, free speech, uh, even when it isn't convenient. That, that's, you know, the general uh, statement. Uh, 
the problem with uh, breaking the silence, and I could name other organizations, or in my view, is that instead of uh, taking their criticism to the IDF and informing the relevant commanders in the IDF of any alleged wrongdoing, their go-to uh, strategy or tactics is uh, to go out of Israel and to try to uh, generate criticism or to apply pressure on Israel from, from outside. We think that much more could be done and uh, the situation could be uh, much better if organizations like Breaking the Silence with others would present whatever evidence or allegations they have to the IDF, let us review it and then act upon it. We have a proven track record of investigating and when needed of also charging our soldiers when someone was found uh, uh, in the wrong, uh, unlawfully using their weapons or whatever it may be. Uh, and I have complete confidence in, in our ability to do so. And I think that is what these organizations should be doing instead of seeking different venues around the world and really aid aiding uh, organizations and entities that have a much more sinister aim for Israel than uh, improving the morality of the idea. But are all their allegations valid? No, I wouldn't say so. I would say that there are many allegations that we have looked into after we learned about them in the media. We looked into, investigated them, and found them uh, far from the truth. But we would have done the same investigation had they come forward and said, listen, we think that this such and such happened. We got a report from whomever. Look, please look into it. We would look into it. Yes, ma'am? Oh, yeah? Yeah. First of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for your mic. Wait, one second for the mic. Yeah, yeah we'll get the mic to her. I will ask a very interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, we hear so much about Iran, and you mentioned a lot about Iran. And, uh, so, can I first of all say that Operation Good Neighbor, it was a very successful thing both in the West, but I actually know Syrian people in South Syria mm. who told me how they were very touched and how it really meant a lot to them. And these are obviously Syrian pro-Israel people and they were happy to see other people being touched by this initiative. But anyway, <coughs> my question is that we hear a lot about Iran and we all understand here why. Uh, we don't hear so much um, about Turkey's role in delegitimizing de <coughs> Israel and specifically about President Erdogan's efforts in the Islamic Cooperation Organization to bring together armies or bring together team to what he calls defend uh, Jerusalem, which we all know what it means. So I was wondering whether you have a position on that? Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I think that it wouldn't, I mean, I appreciate your question. I think it's a valid one, but I'll have to be a bit evasive because it I isn't my uh, my job to be speaking about Turkey. Uh, you would be uh, you would probably get a better answer from either the Minister of Strategic Affairs or from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I uh, can speak about Iran because Iran is an enemy country that I is conducting hostile enemy activity against Israel. Therefore, it is my business as a military. Uh, with regards to what you asked, I, I, I'd rather not uh, elaborate, with, with all due respect. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, Eric sure. Stackelbeck, good to see you again. Eric Stackelbeck, TBN and Kufi. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, number one. I said one, before you went out and refreshed yourself, I said that if I ever leave my job, you'll do it better than me. Oh, gosh, so you too. <laughs> Toda raba. Toda raba. That's, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. Jonathan, let me ask you. I've been up north with you uh, in recent months. Number one, tell us about this recent delivery of the S-300 uh, anti-aircraft system from Russia to Syria. Is that a game changer, number one? Does that make things more difficult for the IDF, obviously, to strike against Iranian and Hezbollah targets? Secondly, I feel like we can't talk about Iran without talking about its most lethal proxy, Hezbollah. Could you tell us a bit about Hezbollah's strength level right now? And it seems like they've gained a lot of fighting experience on the ground in Syria. Right. So the three, S-300, uh, not really a surprise. It's been in the making for, uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, I will focus my answer in a very short sentence. Uh, the IDF will continue to implement Israeli government policy and we will continue to 
uh, defend our strategic interests. Uh, and uh, the second part about uh, Hezbollah, I don't know how many of you know, Hezbollah lost approximately 400, uh, sorry, 747, 750 combatants, people that were trained to, to use weapons in the Second Lebanon War against Israel. Uh, they have lost, according to our assessments, around 3,000 combatants, operatives. I don't give them the honor of calling them soldiers because that's a totally different level of, uh, of uh, moral and ethics. Uh, but they have lost uh, almost 3,000 combatants fighting in Syria. Uh, many of them in Deir Azul, Raqqa, and other places that are, that are hundreds of kilometers away from, uh, from Syria. Now that has come at a price for Hezbollah. Uh, many bereaved families ask, is this what I send my son from southern Lebanon or from the Bekaa Valley uh, to do? Is he there to do the heavy lifting and the dirty work and the war crimes at the behest of uh, the Assad regime uh, or Iran? Uh, or, uh, or, or is Hezbollah the so-called the defender of Lebanon as they claim and they try to brand themselves to be? So there are many challenges for, for Hezbollah, how to replenish weapons, how to uh, fill the lines again, how to train these, uh, uh, the, the new, new recruits, and to maintain morale. Uh, I would say that they have gained a few important pieces or important things. They have now been exposed to and been part of maneuver warfare, which for those of you who are not uh, from the military, it's like the major league of military operations, right? You can. The little league would be to defend static positions, but really to be able to maneuver, to conduct operations in enemy terrain is really uh, indicates of, of elevated military capabilities. And Hezbollah has had an opportunity to fight alongside uh, Syrians, other uh, uh, mercenaries in, uh, uh, in Syria, uh, to see how uh, air fire is uh, coordinated and conducted, logistics, intelligence, etc. That, of course, is uh, excellent experience for Hezbollah. Hezbollah would be very uh, ill-advised to think that that newly uh, gained experience would be a match to the IDF. Um, whereas in the past they have been successful in using the local civilian infrastructure for their military purposes, all of the logistics were from within the villages, their fire was conducted from within the houses, so they didn't have to really move things about. Most of their missiles are still located in, uh, hidden behind uh, civilians. Uh, but it's a, we're at an interesting, interesting situation where Hezbollah, we see that they're toying with the idea of maybe should we try to maneuver into Israel. Um, and uh, we're not relying only on the good understanding and their, the, their instincts of, of, uh, of self-preservation, Hezbollah. We're also, of course, preparing our forces, collecting intelligence uh, uh, at, at, at very high levels uh, and detail uh, of Hezbollah. And we're also building new infrastructure, uh, defensive infrastructure along the border to make sure that at those places where there is a uh, tactical, geographical weakness. We're able to add layers of security so that there's a hard obstacle between Hezbollah on one hand, on one side, and Israeli civilians on the other, uh, against these newly uh, new capabilities that Hezbollah has. All right, we have time for one more question. So. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that's uh, that's an interesting. Sorry in the front. Sorry. For